back today talking about uh, basically rotational isomeric states. Um, so we've talked about conformers and isomers in uh, lecture one, uh, and we all know the difference uh, between conformers and isomers, uh, so we won't go and uh, re revisit that uh, uh, discussion. But anyways, um, a conformer can be related by basically these different kind of rotational uh, states, so rotational isomeric states, and we talked about previously that, uh, again, looking at this molecule uh, for butane, we don't want these big bulky groups, if they're kind of right on top of each other or close to each other, like in this D case, our energy is high. So if our energy is high, we don't like that. We always want energy to be low as possible and negative. So there are going to be some states here. Uh, so again, all of these are different possible rotational isomeric states, these A, B, C, D, basically anywhere along these different angles. And these angles here are these B angles. So going back to our kind of presentation here, these torsional angles. So those rotations around uh, around this uh, kind of that carbon-carbon bond, these are the angles. So they could occupy any angle basically between those. And again, remember, depending on the temperature, we could have 10 to the 10 rotations per second. So they could occupy any angle here in these rotational isomeric states. However, as we see in this energy landscape, we can see that some states are very, very high energy and thus less probable. So one of the cool things you could always take with the energy landscape, if I want to plot the probability landscape from 180 to, you know, 180 here, minus 180 should be, bring it over here, all I have to do is flip it. So here where I was at my lowest energy, that is going to correlate to my highest probability. So, excuse me, I'm going to go from, so it's high probability to low to high to super low to high again to low, but not super low, and then at the top. So I just take the inverse. So the probability is basically inversely related to my energy landscape. So it's kind of a nice way to kind of think about, uh, and kind of a cool thing, uh, you'll see that a lot in physics and polymers and really anywhere you kind of are looking at energy landscape. So it's a nice uh, kind of idea. So uh, why are we kind of <laughs> focusing on this? Because, again, we need to take into account these phi angles, these kind of rotational states, because depending on if they're in this configuration or this configuration or this configuration, my distance, my RMS distance, is going to change. Because here, we're in that fully extended trans states. That's the long, you know, we're elongating that polymer. Here, they're a little bit kind of closer together. So it's going to depend, at, and our size of our polymer is going to change. So what we need to do is not only look, like last time, we looked at bond angles that were fixed. But here, there are multiple bond angles, rotational angles, that can exist. So we're no longer kind of fixed here. They could span. We have to deal with all of these different bond angles. So how are we going to do that? Well, what we're going to do is, again, a statistical mechanics, statistical mechanics uh, technique. We are going to take an ensemble average. Um, so basically, we're going to kind of consider the energy landscape here, consider these probabilities, and then average out uh, basically what states are most probable, what distance that correlates to, and then look at how that affects that RMS distance. So, are you ready for some statistical mechanics uh, derivations? I hope not, because I am not going to go through, <laughs> through all of those. Um, so, what this is doing, this kind of, uh, again, this is an ensemble average, and this is taking into account, again, the kind of total average energy landscape here, the angles that correspond uh, to kind of those, uh, those energies, and it's kind of doing, again, this is kind of it's similar. It's this probability idea. So, this is basically kind of like your total like number of microstates, depending on those energies. And this is uh, that cosine angle, so it's the specific one that you're looking at. So it's like your uh, gamma here. So this is the specific angle you're looking at. What's the probability of measuring that? And we're averaging that all throughout those angles. So we're skipping the derivation. It's extremely, extremely difficult. This is not a statistical mechanics course. If you're interested in that, you can look it up in Statistical Mechanics of Change Molecules, which is Flory's text. Uh, uh, you could also look at the hindered rotational model as well, but Flory is going to be coming up very, 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 very soon. So, if you go throughout this whole derivation, you'll reproduce, and we still have, this is our component from last time for bond angles, and you'll get this expression to, count, uh, to account for your RIS states. So, your Flory characteristic ratio, then fully, finally, completely done, is this. So, that's it. Uh, that is your Flory characteristic uh, ratio that, can't, that considers our bond angles theta and our rotational angles p. So 
we've kind of just talked about this before. C infinity must be at least one. Uh, and again, this implies that actually very interesting that ideal chain is the most coiled confirmation. That's not necessarily the case. We can kind of compress. Um, uh, we can compress our polymer a little bit more, but we'll we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. <laughs> um, but anyways, the C infinity must be at least one. Uh, opposed uh, as opposed to this kind of uh, the idea, it has to be equal to one. And usually it varies between one and twenty. Uh, so again, if we're restricting bond rotations. Um, we are, if we're, our angles are fixed, if we're more rigid, if it's hard to kind of rotate those bulky groups, we are going to be essentially more extended, leading to a uh, more elongated polymer, leading to a C infinity value that's higher, leading to an R squared to the one half power that is more, uh, larger as well. So, larger. Excellent. So, uh, this C infinity value, as we've said, we, it takes into account bond angles and phi. Incorporated in, uh, both of these somewhat is this idea of excluded volume effects. And we're going to talk a lot about excluded volume uh, a little bit later on in this lecture. But just to give a sneak preview and a little bit definition, um, excluded volume, it's kind of a, a little bit of a confusing topic. But basically, there's some around each monomer unit. So I have a monomer unit. There's some kind of sphere, some volume that other molecules cannot cross or move into the sphere. And that sphere will grow or it'll shrink depending on kind of the chemical structure. Uh, so pseudo volume, uh, they occur between monomers far apart in the chain. So again, this chain can't bite back around and in, basically invade that excluded volume effect. So because there's some excluded volume around, that, uh, around each monomer unit, we're going to lead, the larger that excluded volume, the larger our RMSD, right? Because if this volume is large here, as composed, let's say I have another polymer that's like this. Here, the excluded volume is smaller. So this can, this can be more compact. Larger excluded volume means larger R squared. R miss distance it increases as well. Excellent. Um, so it will increase the R squared of the polymer chain. So again, what's the physical interpretation of this like excluded volume? Well, we've kind of already done an example, right? Looking at polyethylene, polystyrene, which will have a large excluded volume. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> or you'll tell me. Uh, this bulky kind of chain right here, that's going to be hard to rotate, right? And when you think about it on the polymer chain, if each of these has that kind of side group, my that pendant group, effectively, my excluded volume is going to be larger for each of these polymer chains, or these monomer segments composed compared to polyethylene. So uh, polystyrene with that large bulky phenyl group will have a large excluded volume than polyethylene when it's just uh, hydrogen. So uh, that is going to lead to a more extended chain, and thus it means that our C infinity for polystyrene is going to be larger than our C infinity for polyethylene. Same thing for your bond angles as well, as we kind of talked about. So always think about not only bond stiffness, but bond rotation and excluded volume. How bulky are these side chains? How difficult is it to rotate? Are there molecular interactions that make it more difficult to, to rotate uh, that could possibly be in play as well? So those are kind of key things to kind of play around with. Now, we've been dealing and kind of pretending that these polymers are just in the melt situation, that they're not interacting with anything else besides themselves. But lots of times, most of the time, polymers, especially in biology, polymers are in some solvent. So uh, we'll talk a lot about solvent in lecture four and what kind of constitutes a solvent. Um, basically, it's just the majority component from chemistry. It could be an organic solvent, it could be water, it could be um, salt solution, it could be blood, it could be anything uh, 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 that's the majority component in the system. But these excluded volume interactions uh, will also depend on the monomer solvent interactions. So we've talked a lot about hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So if I have a hydrophobic polymer, this means that uh, that polymer does not like water. If I put it in water, so if I put a hydrophobic polymer, if I put that guy in water, it does not want to interact with uh, the solvent. The polymer will want to coil and collapse. So it will go from that state, if I put it in that you know, water solution, it will collapse in on itself. So it wants to avoid these interactions at all, at all costs. So the excluded volume will decrease. So the excluded volume of that polymer chain, we, it will decrease. <laughs> I can't emphasize uh, that enough. So if we then, instead, if we put you know, that material in a hydrophobic uh, solvent, something that it likes, it wants to increase 
those favorable enthalpic interactions. So the monomer, each monomer unit wants to interact with as many like solvent molecules as possible because these interactions are very, very favorable energetically. What I mean by favorable energetically, delta H is very, 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 very small. So uh, then we will lead to a more extended chain like we've talked about in class. So the next time we are going to talk about solvent quality, what factors go into that, what makes a good solvent uh, and a bad solvent, and how that changes basically this kind of uh, value of alpha. So more on that uh, in the next video. Thanks. Let me know if there's any questions. Have a good day. Uh, enjoy. If you're, uh, if you're motivated to get into statistical mechanics, let me know. I'll be happy to help. And we will talk next time. Thanks. Bye.